Wolf Tatupu was a fan favorite during his six seasons with the Seahawks. The Hawks drafted him in the second round in 2005, and he played every game his rookie season, a season when the Seahawks went to the Super Bowl for the first time in their history. And that was a heck of a start to your NFL career, Lofa. A lot of rookies need that first season to learn to play at the highest level, not you. 85 tackles, four sacks, three interceptions. Uh, having said all that, what was the key to making the transition from college to pro? Honestly, you know, I've been asked this, you know, several times, and when I look back, it was um, actually just being second-generation football player. So my dad played for 14 years, and I felt like I had been in all those situations already. So whether it was the locker room, the film room, all these advantages I had growing up was really what, what set apart my transition from college to pro. Yeah, I want to talk to you about your dad, too, in just a few. Was there a game uh, that rookie season uh, or a time during that season when you realized uh, you'd made it? Um, no, I tried not to ever have that, that moment like, oh, yeah, I got this. Because when, you know, you're undersized, you know, underweight for the position, you know, the prototype was much taller and, and faster than me. So, um I always play with that chip on my shoulder and never uh, never really said, yo, I've arrived. You know, you talk about undersized players, and, and I was I grew up in Detroit watching the Lions, and Chris Spielman was one of those guys, another second-round pick, yeah. and he had great football instincts, but everybody kind of steered clear of him because of his size. But, you know, he turned out to be a tremendous player. Um, you're, you're kind of in that thing where Tim Ruskell moved up several picks to get you uh, in the second round. How much did that make you want to just step up for the Seahawks when they make a move like that? Absolutely. Um, you know, they, they, they put it all on the line for me, uh, even trading up, because, you know, you were hearing those, those, those draft pundits tell you, okay, well, I don't know what they're doing going for this undersized guy, you know, three rounds too early. But um, so when you, they got your back like that, you go all out for them. And, um, you know, I just tried to play as hard as I could every, every snap. Yeah. I mean, you, you did, and that's what made you uh, – part of what made you a fan favorite. Do you, you know, in your short time, you played six seasons with the Seahawks. You played for three different head coaches, Holmgren, Mora, Pete Carroll. Uh, did all three have completely different styles? They were, and, um, but they were all – you know, they, they brought, you know, their best every day, and that's something that, you know, you can appreciate no matter who's coaching, you know, as long as you see, you know, this is uh, – this is – my values, my beliefs, and how we're going to go about getting getting it done, you know, that's something you appreciate and you take away something from all of them. Uh, which one was uh, – which of those coaches was most demanding, do you think? Uh, definitely hungry. I don't even – yeah, I don't even have to think about that one. Um, and that was just uh, – that was his style. And, um, and you know, what you appreciate, you know, from Holmgren's style was – there were, you know, everyone got treated the same. It doesn't matter if you're the, you know, the starting quarterback with your Haas, the MVP in, uh, in Sean Alexander, or, you know, uh, undrafted rookie. Like, you all got treated the same. And uh, with that kind of respect, you, you have not, you know, no choice but to, to give the respect back. That's kind of cool. So you say when, when they all got treated the same, like if they were mistakes made at any level? <laughs> Yeah, whether whether it was good or whether it was bad, you know, I remember uh, you know coming off the field a couple times, and you know he he let me know he's like, hey, you know, I know your responsibility, and you better get over there next time. And so I was like, okay, yeah, coach, you know, and, and not such a nice manner, but that's that's the you know relationship that he had with his players. He just he told you how it was, and that's what you you know you go to bat for. I know I grew up playing for my dad. He was pretty demanding, you know, being a fourteen. Year NFL vet, um, he made a Pro Bowl, so he has those expectations. And then you place on a father's expectations of what his kid should be doing, and uh, you know it was right in line with what I grew up with. So you come off the field, he'll fire one line at you. It's not a discussion, right? Even a stare. <laughs> oh, just a stare. <laughs> I remember one time uh, he was. Uh, we were playing Denver, and like I think the first team meeting, he said, "Hey, you know." They got this guy over here on the left side, Champ Bailey, uh, number 24. He said, that is a, you know, a no-fly zone. Just don't even look that way. And, you know, so Champ kind of baited Matt a little bit. You know, it was like, all right, they're not throwing my way. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to hang out. And DJ Hackett just, you know, he pulled off on him, probably about five, seven-yard, you know, distance. And, you know, Hass being the competitor and the leader that he was, he's like, yo, I'm taking it. I see my shot. I'm taking it. And that's the way we loved Hass, right? And Champ looked up. He picked his knees up, five yards, caught up, intercepted it. And so I see Haas coming off, and, you know, I walk by Haas, and I'm like, yo, good luck, Chief. Holmgren wants to see you. <laughs> and and Holmgren's just looking at Haas like, no, come over here, pointing the finger like, yo, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and so I slapped – I'm running by, and I slapped Haas on the back. I was like, you know, and it looks like, yo, I'm saying, hey, you know, um, it's all good. I got you, which I did. Of course I always told him that. But I told him at that point, yo, Holmgren wants to see you. Good luck. <laughs> 
Because, you know, I've, I've talked to Hasselbeck and Mike at different times uh, about their relationship. And, man, uh, you're right. I mean, he's your quarterback. It didn't matter to Holmgren. He, he would light you up. Oh, he kept everybody in check. And, I mean, that's why we, we always had just a, you know, a sense. You look at those teams, just the toughness. Even, even you go to that last year, 2008, we had about 20 or 23 guys on injured reserve. And, yeah, we ended up 4-12. and 12. But when you have that many people out for the season – I know me, Patrick Kearney, Leroy Hill, we all had a cast on our wrist. Um, I think even Deion Grant had one. Um, so, you know, just just decimated with injuries. And we only lost one game, I believe it was the Giants, by more than uh, two scores. Everything was one score or less. And most of them, there was four or five games with, like, the last drive, whether it was offense or defense, we lost the game. You're playing for a guy who, who has quite the resume, too. So, I mean, that was almost instant respect. Oh, honor. And I got to see him the other night at Cliff's, uh, Cliff Averill's event. So it was just it's great to catch up with him. Yeah. December 2nd, 2007, Seahawks of Philadelphia. It's cold. It's snowing. You pick off uh, A.J. Feely three times in that game. Three interceptions, three great returns, too. Uh, you know, was that the game of your life? Um, yeah, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to say so. Um, the one I'm most proud of is the NFC Championship, even though I don't remember most of, most of it. <laughs> but um, in terms of, you know, performance-wise, yes, I'd say that was, that was the one I'm, I'm remembered for most. Yeah. When you say you can't remember most of it, the, the, is it the, the Panthers game? There, yeah, there was a toss there with me and Nick Goings we went head-to-head. It was, you know. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. A mild, mild concussion. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> But but after that Philadelphia game, you you're so back then you you really didn't want to talk to the press. So that's why it's great to sit here and chat with you today because it's like you are a, a different you have a different approach to it. it. Seems like you're way more at ease. But back then, as a young guy in the NFL, what was it that you didn't want to you you just not comfortable? Didn't want to say anything wrong? I, that's that's exactly what it was. And uh, you know I think a lot for me even even social anxiety to some extent and just you know just like hey well this is you know i gotta always say the right thing and i always got to do the right thing and you try to but you know you're human right and i think um most of what that comes from you know the, the new company i started has has put me more at ease and, and more receptive like hey just it's it's all good just you know be yourself okay let's bring it up since you brought it up <laughs> um zone in give me the name of the company and and what you're doing Okay, so we started, uh, and I say we, we uh, or big launch comes October 16th. It's called Zone In CBD. A lot of athletes you see, and you know, they're they're uh, giving you know a lot of praise to CBD as as helping them recover from injuries, help with sleep. You're not directly allowed to make claims because of the FDA has yet to make a ruling on it. So I won't say it. I'll just say how I feel is I feel better than I did in my prime. And I was you know telling you that earlier. Um, when I was coaching, I was about 275 pounds, and, um, you know, now people see me today like, yo, what are you doing? And so I start to tell them about my experience with it, found it three years ago, and since the uh, farm bill passed in 2018 of December, uh, I decided to make, you know, uh, a go of it and just help, you know, spread it to others. And uh, so, the, you know, the, if you look at the logo, you got the negative space Z, and then you got the... Uh, Inside, you get the two triangles, right? One pointing up, one pointing down. We call it balance because a lot of people, they, they, they're selling CBD, and, but they're not really telling what it does for you. And so because of those, those rules, we're kind of, you know, but what we're saying is it promotes balance in your life. And that's how I feel, and that's why you hear and see a different loafer than you did when I was playing because just like you said, you wanted to prep me with those questions. And I'll let you talk about that if you want, how, how, how I was and how, you know, um, you know, regimented I had to be in my interview, if, if, you, if you have any that you recall. No, I mean, you were, you were just – you were such a good player and, and seemingly such a nice guy that you were t- made for television. I mean, really. And so and, – but you were unaccessible, you know, like we – you know, and it was like – We'd come to those guys and say, yeah, um, can we get low for today? He's like, he, you know, he's not talking. Or, oh, I can ask. You know, it's like, it, I mean, so we know the answer. We all ask, you know, good cop, bad cop. And I apologize for that. But, um, but on top of it, it was always me, is, you know, from a, from a humble aspect of humility, trying, you know, I always wanted to heap praise on, on my teammates. Yeah. So we talk about that, that Philly game. And, um, you know, what I remember from it, I missed three tackles. You know, yeah. so everybody else, you know, they're like, oh, interceptions and 13 tackles. I'm like, yo, I missed a sack and two two more tackles, which, you know, 
that's the stuff that, you know, made me, I really, you want to talk, I was zoned in on that stuff. That's what I was, you know, worried about. I was like, man, it could have been better. And so I think that, you know, it helped me in my work ethic, but it also kind of held me back in terms of, you know, my full potential. So when you talk about your regiment and things like that, is it a byproduct of your of your father? And, and Absolutely. And my upbringing, and now, like, my dad, we can talk about his expectations, but then, you know, the, the tougher one might have been my mom, who was the oldest of seven, and her dad was a Marine, her mom's in the Air Force. So, uh, yeah, if you I had all the makings for, <laughs> yo, this is how we do things. And uh, But, I, you know, I'm grateful for it. Um, it's it's given me all the tools that I need to be, you know, successful in, in life. And um, so, you know, I... I cherish it. So, you when you coached, you said you were two seventy five, like yeah. I, you know, and you couldn't really tell maybe because you were wearing sweats or a hoodie or something like that. But um, but you're always you know you always you were hitting the weights. Were you hitting the weights then too? No, no, I, I wasn't. So it wasn't a it wasn't a buff two seventy five. Five eleven two seventy five is a tough look to pull off. I don't care who you are, uh, unless you're an Olympic bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so it was just um. You know, I, I came across this through, you know, through, you know, reading stories. I heard it. It usually takes two or three times before someone, you know, actually picks something up and tries it, right? They, they hear about it once. They're like, oh, well, it's not for me. It's, it's tough to, you know, implement it into your daily, you know, routine. Well, so then, you know, after ball, you know, I heard about it again, and I was did more research. And um, this is where, it, you know, I'm probably not supposed to talk too much about this part, but um, I started looking into, you know, the effects of, um, there was one strain called Charlotte's Web, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, and it was for uh, created for a girl who had epilepsy, and she was getting 300 seizures in a week, and by taking this, it went down to three, and so I was like, okay, well, there's a mind muscle connection there, right? And there's there's something you know happening in something she's experiencing. Well, this is why we got doctors and everything, but at the time, I was like, yo, I'm gonna try this anyways, and so within the state. You know, I started finding, I found one product uh, made from James and Wendy Hull. It's called Fairwinds. And as um, I took that, it was phenomenal. And I, I started feeling, like, great, not just good. Started coming back, you know, to, to working out. And it really brought me back to, like, that warrior mentality, that, that, that you know, the loafer that you saw, you know, when he was a rookie and uh, before all the injuries and, and, and you know, um, trauma took place, you know, not just physically, but also mentally from all the concussions. So with all that, I was like, oh, this is uh, this is real. And it's making me feel, you know, better than I've ever felt. So, you know, I started um, doing my research more, got, the, you know, a board of doctors together and, you know, then a bunch of you know, another 12 athletes that we have on board, you know, we'll be releasing this on October 16th. And, uh, and I'm excited about it. And, uh, you know, there's been great reviews about the product. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Is it, so that, that's kind of the launch date for you guys? That's what we're looking to. Yeah. yeah. Big launch date in October 16th. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's pretty much common knowledge that, that, uh, pro athletes use it, use, um, well, marijuana back in the day before CBD mm -hmm. came out and, 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 and the, the lotions and ointments and things like that um, and topicals. But, uh, you know, those guys are using it to, to relieve pain. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a huge thing. I mean, so when, you're, when you see this and, and, and they see that, oh, Lofa Tatupu is behind this one, they, it must come with some credibility, some cachet. Like, this guy knows what he's talking about. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I've lived it more importantly than just, you know, because I, I would never endorse or, or you know, even never start a business around a product that I didn't fully use in my daily routine and, and believe in. And um, one step further, the, the, the ones I was using, the, the Fair Winds Cannabis, that's cannabis. This is hemp-derived, which, so there's, no you know, little to no THC. The FDA rule or the... Um, the federal legal limit, 0.3% THC or less. Otherwise, you're not allowed to have, you know, interstate commerce and, and sell it online. So ours is hemp derived and it's full spectrum, which means it's got the whole plant extract. And there's so many more. What CBD, cannabidiol, is a phytonutrient of the plant, one in one particular compound. There's all these other ones, CBG, CBN, CBC, and like they... This is what the doctors will be telling you, you know, in the future. But I just, I, I've been doing a lot of reading on it. And, you know, because I've tried several products before finding the, the two that I really believe in. The one from, in the five, I-502, which is the recreational cannabis space, that's James and Wendy Hull. 
Fairwinds. Um, you can give them a follow because they do great work and um, just two of the nicest people I've ever met. But then this one that we've created is hemp derived and um, zone in CBD. So give us a follow on, on social. Yeah, so you're it. building that up too. It's go yeah we're we're you know full it's gonna be a full launch and we got a bunch of uh, my my old teammates on board and then even some some people from a couple other sports too uh, Major League Baseball and uh, and PGA. So is it is it is it topical and is it only strictly topicals or pills or right now there's just two it's really even just one product and you know we didn't want to confuse we're here we're here to educate rather than confuse people with a you know. You come out with a ton of products, and it's like, okay, well, what do I take and why? Mm -hmm. So this is really just one product. It's two different delivery methods. So uh, we got the, the uh, sublingually, you take the dropper, and that's roughly 16 milligrams. And then the other one's a capsule, which is 15 milligrams. And um, you just ingest that orally. And, um, yeah, we've just had some tremendous feedback. I take it every day, and, uh, you know, now, I, you know, I even play basketball every day. That was one of my other loves outside of football yeah. was hoops. And so I play – my record is 17 straight days, two hours a day. And, wow. Yeah, and I've done it without the use of an anti-inflammatory. This is not a topical. This is this is just orally. No, but we are in formulation and talks to to add a topical. Okay. Yes, man. Just listen to you. Like you know, I thought this was gonna be a football interview, and I'm listening. You you are absolutely well educated in this. You've obviously done your research, and you have a passion for it. I, I you know I live it. You know, some people that they they endorse it. No, I live it, and um, just. I, I've been seeing it, you know, impact a lot of people in great ways, and so I fully believe in it. And yeah, it, it, I'm just I'm still learning. I'm gonna continue to get better. Yeah. We, how many concussions did you think you had, or do you? Because you, you probably don't know exact I, number, huh? It's like roughly between college and pros, like 15 plus. Like, cause I don't count. So my I would call it like five or six that like I count as concussions because. You know, I'm talking where I needed help getting off the field, and I didn't know where I was. And, um, you know, so that was about five or six times between college and NFL. Yeah, when you talk about that Panthers-NFC championship game, that was, that was a – it was a scary and, moment, huh? Even for and, fans watching you. And somehow, somehow I played through that. And I mean, I think a lot of it has to do because I was young, and that was the first, like, probably you know, second bad one that you know I, I've had. I had one in college too, um, but, but yeah. Um, and, and with all that, you know, and I, I just I don't ever I, I want the NFL to come off great with this because I, I love the NFL and I'll do anything to protect the shield too. So like I, it's part of the game and it's you know it's unfortunate it's an, an evil necessary like that's what we're out there doing is, is is we're battling. Yeah, well, you bring that up and the fact that you still love the NFL and still love football. You know, as, as a dad, uh, do you want your kids to play this sport? Um, I don't know if I, I want them to. I only want them to if they want to. Uh, I think you have to have the passion for football. Uh, if you don't, you're just going to get hurt or you're going to get somebody else hurt. You know, you got you got 10 other teammates out there on the field at any point that, you know, you have to have their best interest, not just your own. Um, so my oldest, he's really into – I got two boys, eight and five, Kai and Kane. And uh, my oldest is really into arts, music, so I'm trying to just support him in that you know and um you know i sit there and draw with him even though i'm a terrible drawer he's good he's eight years old he always draws better than me <laughs> but that's all a perspective thing from the artist mind is he he can actually you know draw out what he sees and uh, you know i my one of your eyebrows if i was to draw you one of your eyebrows would be over here <laughs> the nose wouldn't be you know in, in in correlation to it so it's it's funny though, you know um, how you, how you find the different talents that they have and just support them any way they can. Now my youngest, he he's just he's about that life. He 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 ran in to hug me one time and he ran so hard and he didn't stop that he like knocked my shoulder back and wow. I was like okay that was real power. <laughs> and he's only five, so in two more years, I'm pretty sure you're going to see him on the football field. Yeah, you think he's going to have some size too or built a yeah. lot like you or well yeah and i was talking about it earlier um that uh he is he's he's mini lofa to a t just attitude everything that's uh that's my mini me and uh <laughs> and so you know we'll see you know hopefully he gets a little more height right <laughs> <laughs> or you know a little quicker all those yeah. things they put on your you know the derogatory notes on your scouting report yeah but um but he, he definitely he has a passion for all sports um basketball baseball um like he loved t-ball this past year so 
And, um, you know, I th- he's definitely going to be gravitating towards towards uh, athletics. Okay, so that's kind of a father-son relationship there. But when you were watching your dad, Mosey, play for 14 seasons, 13 with New England, um, uh, how much fun was that for you, having a dad in the NFL? It, you know, I loved it. And looking back, I cherish it more now. I can appreciate it more now, especially having gone through it. But at the time, it was normal to me, right? Everyone's dad plays in the NFL. That's what I thought. I was like, oh, you know. So, uh, but um, especially because I knew the Hasselbacks back right. then. I went, um, the, the youngest, Nathaniel, was you know, so, uh, roughly the same grade as me. So, um, yeah, I didn't really think much of it, you know, it, uh, until – until one time, right after he retired, I think it was like 93 or 94, like a year or two after he retired, um, the Chargers came to town, and then a couple of weeks later, the uh, the Niners came to town. I got to meet Junior Seau, and I got to meet uh, Joe Montana, and I was like, okay. And they know who my dad is? This is the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that is cool, man. Um, and he, your dad coached you in high school, right? He did. So yep. what was that like? Because junior, senior year, you were a quarterback and a linebacker. Yeah. So what was it like playing for your dad? Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of directions and orders. Hey, get down. Like, don't take that extra hit. And I was like, yo, I'm a starting middle linebacker, though, too. Like, I, I can't be over here sliding as a quarterback. So I only play. I only know how to play one way. And uh, so there was times, you know, it was a little tough. And, you know, we didn't see eye to eye. Um, but, you know, uh, end of the day, I appreciate everything and all, all that he taught me, you know, about the sport. Is he harder on you than, than the other players um, back then? No, I, I think he was. To, you know, at the time I probably felt like he was, but you know, I'm grateful that you know that he was. You know, now that I look back, um, I'd say my mom was the, the, the hardest on me. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, you know, because you've said that a couple of times. That's interesting. You, you know, she, just a fierce competitor in her own right. She did track when she was younger and everything, and she's just uh, like she she got that military mindset. And uh, no, this is how it's done. Yeah. And so that's where. You know, a lot of, um, you know, what I took to the NFL and my approach to the game came from. When you were growing up, was there an age or, or a time you remembered, I wanted to play football? Seven years old. Seven years old. Oh, yeah. You, uh, you hit that like that. Why seven? That's like I was going to more of my dad's games, um, you know, because like, I think that would be 89, 90. Um, he was born 82. So, yeah, I was seeing his last few games, and, um, you know, he still he still had it. And, you know, he was he laid a couple big hits on, on kickoff. And I just remember even being – I told this story at the, the Polynesian Hall of Fame. There was, a, there was a guy up in the stands in the 300s. We were sitting up there, me, my mom, my sister, spilling a beer all over me. And just points, and he goes, your dad's the man. And, you know, he used a couple other choice words, you know. But uh, I was like, man, that, you know, I looked down, and I told my mom, I was like, yo, I'm going to do that one day. Like, yeah, I'm, cool. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move people in that manner, like just that and, get, and bring that kind of energy. And that's what, you know, I hope I did. Well, you definitely did, man. I want to ask you one more question about your dad. He not only was a part of the NFL and part of NFL history, but part of pop culture. Uh, do you remember the episode of The Simpsons? Oh, yeah. Mosey <laughs> Tupu. All right, so for those who don't know, uh, <laughs> Mosey Tupu uh, actually made a, a cameo, sort of, yeah. uh, an audio cameo on The Simpsons. Um, uh, it was a Treehouse of Horrors. Yep. And, uh, episode 3, if you want to look it up on YouTube, I think it was 1992, a year after your dad retired. And uh, someone in the tribe in this show, because Homer was King Kong in this thing, yells, Mosey Tutupu, Mosey Tutupu twice. And so, you know, tell me about that. And what it's, uh, I think it, the subtitle was Capture the Blue Haired Lady. <laughs> was it? Yeah. yeah so yeah. I remember it, uh, you know, pretty, pretty well. And then I think, you know, that's when I had the, oh, wow, my dad made it. And, uh, but I never got like the, the, the story of like how, you know, his name or the connection from, you know, um, the Simpsons and, and their crew of like why they chose his name. You know, if like someone, you know, grew up in Hawaii with my dad or something. Yeah. But um, that was cool. And I remember showing up, I think I was in first or second grade that every kid in the school was like, yo, your dad was on the Simpsons. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I go, he made it. <laughs> You you don't remember the story of, of the connection or anything why he I, even I, made it. I don't think I ever got just some random yeah, thing. Yeah, and but uh, I mean I had there has to be some kind of you know whether it's uh, you know Hawaii or you know his high school Punahou you know there's got to be some kind of deeper connection as to why they you you know used his name. Well, it was pretty funny, man. I mean, that had to be kind of cool because, you know, <laughs> everything he's done, there's a whole other group you reached with that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he played for almost a decade and a half and then, you know, made a Pro Bowl and, you know, everybody's yeah. like, yo, he was on The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I want to get into your USC days. Uh, you, when you came out of high school, you played your college ball at the University of Maine. Why Maine right away? Uh, well, it was one of my only offers. Um, so when I came out of high school, you know, King Philip High School in Rentham, Massachusetts, uh, you know, a lot of the teams didn't even know I played defense. They were recruiting me to play quarterback. And, um, you know, the read option, you know, that, that whole thing wasn't out back then. It was, you know, or the RPO, that system where, you know, you have a chance to sit back and, and, and scan the, uh, the defense. It was just true option. And two of the teams, I believe it was Temple and Rutgers, they were running the, the true option. And then UConn was the other one that they wanted to play uh, quarterback. And I was like, I, start, I did a, like a SWOT analysis back then of, you know, of my business opportunity. I was like, okay, I don't know any 5'11" no Samoan quarterbacks uh, in the NFL, but I know a lot of 5'11", you know, at the time, I think London Fletcher was already in the league, Dexter Coakley, Dad Wynn, Zach Thomas, one of my favorites. I was like, yo, I could I could make a run at this this linebacker thing, but I don't see any other quarterbacks that, you know, that look like me, you know, size or stature. So I made a business decision. I went up to Maine. <laughs> so, so, and how did you get from Maine to USC? So I was, I was fortunate enough. We had a really good team up there, and um, I, I started about half the season because the guy in front of me got hurt, and um, you know I, I played really well. And um, now the starter was going to come back for his senior year, and uh, you know, so I thought I was going to have to split time again, and I. You know, I just talked to my family. I was like, hey, I think this is an opportunity for me to, to transfer. And, you know, I know it was, especially back then, it was not a popular thing, you know, to enter the transfer portal. They didn't even have a portal back right. then. There was like maybe one or two kids doing it. Um, but, you know, I told my parents, I was like, yo, you know, I just, I can do this. I, I don't know if I can play in the NFL yet, but I know I can play at major college football, Division One. And so um, sent out some tapes, and I thought I was going to end up in Oregon. And then out of nowhere, my dad sent the tape to L.A. and, and Pete and his crew at SC and uh, the, the fullback coach, Kennedy Pola, um, the linebacker coach, Nick Holt, and Keith Uparesa, one of the offensive line coach, they all went to bat for me. And um, I got one of the two remaining scholarships. The other one was Frosty Rucker, 14-year vet, uh, oh, yeah. and one of my good friends. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd say we, we did pretty good. Yeah. You know? they, yeah they did pretty they did good, good giving you those, those last two, two right? no doubt. And so, and, and Pete Carroll, you, you know, you must have sat down with him mm -hmm. first time. How was it when you first sat down with him? Well, so I, I didn't know what we were doing there. I thought I was flying out of LAX to go up to, um, you know, Oregon for, to sign my letter of intent up there. And uh, we stopped there. And, uh, you know, Pete and the entire staff are just, like, right there at the front um, when I was at Heritage Hall, where, you know. And so they were like, hey – why don't you go take a tour around the facility? And so I did, and I guess they were watching the tape. And after they watched the tape, because um, Pete's biggest concern was he, he looks like he's too small. And so on the tape, I was probably 215 pounds. And then now, after a full spring, I got up to like 225. And so he saw me. He was like, oh, he's not 210. And, so, <laughs> you know, Pete's in there. He's like, yeah. He's like, okay, so I heard, you know, Oregon's, you know, offering you a scholarship. You know, if I give you a scholarship, will, will you come here instead? And uh, I looked at him, I was like, absolutely. And he just put his hand out, he was congratulations, you're a Trojan. And I was like, wow. And that was like one of the few times my dad, like, you know, later he just he was, hey, man, I'm proud of you. That and, you know, then draft day for the two times that I remember my dad, you know, saying that, you know, give me a hug. And I was like, I'm, you, know, I'm, I, you know, I made it up to his standards, you know. And so that was a good feeling. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a great story. And, and you know, having a – it's funny because it's kind of a good story for other recruits out there because – they don't realize that the more other schools are looking at you, the more your stock goes up. So I'm sure when Oregon was going to offer you a ride, he, Pete's like, well, this guy's legit. At the time, Pete's first season, we were uh, – they were – right before I got there, they were 6-6. Six and six. They went to the Vegas Bowl. And, you know, who, who knew that they were going to become, uh, you know, a powerhouse, right? Uh, Oregon was on top. Uh, of the, I think they just came off like a Fiesta Bowl win, um, and uh, and Joey Harrington, you know, in the Heisman campaign and all that. So like, they had some, you know, some great, you know, ball players up there. And so I think, in in his mind and their in their mind, they're like, yo, if we lose this kid, we might have to see him, you know, for the next couple of years. So um, and the same with with, with Frosty Rucker because there was a lot of teams that were after him too. Well, you, usually when you go on a recruiting trip, someone shows you around. Was there, the, and it's usually a pretty high profile player, especially for someone like you. Did someone show you around, one of the players? Yeah. Who, so, uh, Sean Cody, who ended up becoming my roommate, and he was a second round pick to the Detroit Lions. He played five years there, and then another five or six, I believe, with the Houston Texans. And, um, you know, it was just, it was, it was insane just seeing all the, you know, the, 
literally Heritage Hall. It's got all of the the Heisman trophies, uh, all the defensive awards, and uh, um, I saw Chris Clay's Chris Claiborne's uh, picture up there, who I always thought was one of the greatest linebackers of all time. He wore the coveted fifty five. Um, just 120 tackles, six interceptions. He was, and even Bobby Bowden termed him the toughest defender he ever had to game game plan for him. So I was just like, man. And then I look over to the left, and right before my meeting room, I see a picture of this guy with the fro rocking the 36, and it's my dad. And I'm like, okay, he's got a plaque. I got to get one too because it was a national championship, um, the the uh, 7014. And so – you know, he he joked that we I won up to him because we we won too. Right, but that's so. right. Well, you uh, you know, Pete and we talked about um this a little bit, but you know, in the recruiting process, well, let's just talk about Pete Carroll. Pete Pete was your head coach. Um, he allowed fans in to watch practice, which was a little bit different back then. Um, and he admitted recently that he went a little overboard with his Hollywood approach to the program and kind of a little too braggadocious when you know, it came to all the winning and everything they did down there and everything they accomplished. Did you feel at all that way when you were there that, you know, man, p- pounding your chest like we're USC? Uh, no, because I don't, I don't think we had that, that kind of mentality. I mean, yeah, okay times were fun and I mean that's when you're winning it's fun uh, we I think we reeled off close to 40 straight games over that three-year span uh, only losing to Aaron Rodgers and Cal in triple overtime so like um, I, I wouldn't say it was and when you say fans I remember seeing movie stars like on the sidelines so I guess if that's where Pete was going <laughs> no with, see that's our next question yeah. it's like you know he, he brought it up he's like yeah come check us out now he's got movie stars comedians oh, things yeah. like that Will Ferrell was there Snoop Dogg uh, I mean it was you know but it was it was it wasn't that like you know for us we didn't take it as like oh my god we made it uh, we were like, yo, if you want to keep seeing stars like that come watch you practice, you better put on your best performance, not just on game day, but right here, because that's you know, you, you you play like you practice, you know, and just you got to carry that over. And so um, I, I think it just made us go harder, if anything. Did, do you remember anything, any specific visit or any specific um, speech or any that anybody gave you guys? Because some of them would talk to the team. Uh, yeah, Keyshawn Johnson. Uh, yeah. He came back, spoke to the team. And I think Keyshawn might have played for Pete in New York. Uh, but he just said, hey, you know, this guy knows how to take this program from where we're at and put us on the map. So, you know, listen up and, and you know, not just here. You'll be, you know, happy with what you do in the NFL too. And so Keyshawn Johnson, one of the greatest, it's, you know, says that to you. You, you listen up. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's the other thing. At USC, <clears throat> you could trot guys in every day two or three times a day and see that kind of caliber, huh? Yeah. Uh, I mean, even just think about we had a walk-on in Clay Matthews. Clay Matthews, who's going to be a Hall of Famer, I fully believe, uh, he was a walk-on. And, like, that's just the legacy. And, like, he, he had offers at, at the Mountain West and at smaller – at other schools in the pack. And he was just like, nah, I'm meant to be here. And, I mean, look at what he's done. I'm not surprised because he, he went hard like that, you know, every day. And I, I really even think he would have been a Hall of Fame Mike linebacker. You saw the one year, was it three years ago, when they got in some trouble at Green Bay at, at Mike Backer. They're like, oh, we'll just slide Clay inside. And, and he goes to the Pro Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, he was, dude, we were loaded, man. Yeah. yeah. Ray Mauluga, Brian Cushing, Kaluka Maiava, Keith Rivers. Uh, it's just the list. That was all the linebackers. Yeah. I mean, you, you could go on all day. That's true. You're right. You're just naming off one position there. But, yeah. But did you have a favorite linebacker growing up? Uh, junior Seau. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, and then, of course, uh, you know, I mean, Junior was just uh, the epitome of how you're supposed to play, the the, the energy, the essence of, of the linebacker. He brought everything, attitude, you know, style, uh, athleticism. And, you know, obviously, you know, he was like 6'2", 6'3", 255, 260, so I couldn't, you know, do a lot of the things he did. But, um, you know, you, you wanted to mimic everything he did because he just did it the right way. Yeah, yeah he was impressive. Uh, best college football rivalry game back then? Was it Notre Dame? Was it UCLA? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, we beat them up both pretty good, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, UCLA. And, you know, I, you know, I know after the fact that they don't appreciate this but in, in 04 there was a fumble on the sideline and i think they got they got a bad call because that it would have changed the tide of the game but um can't live in the past so it, <laughs> 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 it, it was um 
that that was a thing because they were, you know, um, that was all that was standing in between us and going to the national championship against Oklahoma. And I tell you what, they gave us hell that day. Yeah. We, do you have a most memorable college game back then? Most memorable college. Stanford, uh, 2004. We, psh, man, they had us on the ropes first half. I think we were down like 11 or they broke. We were down for most of the first half. We kind of caught back up and we got to within four. And then they broke like an 80-yard run. Um Right before the half, we thought they were running out the clock, and they hit a seam, 80 yards, gone. Uh, it was J.R. Lemon was the running back. And because all I saw was the number nine in the back of his jersey, I was like, man, that guy's fast. So we go down 11, and then uh, we go into the half, and, you know, but the energy picked up, and everybody's like, hey, yo, this, this ain't nothing. We got this. And, you know, and so we're all getting, you know, you know, getting riled up, ready to go back out there. Like, yo, we don't need to make adjustments. We just got to get back on the field. And Pete was like, settle down. He's like, we got some, you know, some stuff to go over before we get back out there. And uh, But then, you know, he, he charged us right back up, and he goes, all right, you know, cut it loose. And we went out there after giving up 330 yards in the first half on defense. I think we gave up uh, one first down and 35 yards. Whoa. Yeah. So big turnaround. And then Reggie and Liner and all them bailed us out. You know, yeah, you had some weapons on that side of the ball too. A couple, a couple <laughs> guys. But, but Pete was pretty cool, man. Like, like you got to play for him in college and in the pros. I mean, you see the energy he brings, and he's obviously a master motivator, and uh, you know, inspired you guys. Um, what, what was your, what's your take on Pete? Give me, you know, I think his best asset is the way he inspires confidence in his players, and um, how. There's a lot of guys that, you know, they get in their own way. And, and he's just like, no, this is how you do it. And, you know, he brings them up. And, uh, and the positivity of the, and the coaching is really encouraging for a lot of guys that, you know, they're already in their own head as soon as they mess up. And, and Pete's like, no, yeah, you let that go. You got another play to line up for. And, like, he just the way he teaches it and then also teaching the game. Um, I mean, the proof's in all the wins, man. Yeah. You know, there were some guys that left here uh, a, a bit bitter in recent years, and they would say that they'd get in these team meetings with Pete, and they hear the same thing over and over. And they've almost, I think Michael Bennett said he fell asleep. He would just take a nap back there, which, you know, maybe was an exaggeration. But, <laughs> but is it, was it, did, it, did you ever get tired of listening to the same stuff with Pete? Um, I mean, you know, it's tired of it. I wouldn't say tired because you don't get tired of winning, right? And then, you know, also – um, if if you're really you know a student of the game or, or even just trying to get better as as a player or a person, um, you can find new meaning in, in, in the same same lesson or, or how it's delivered. You, you'll find it you know again as if it's the first time. And because um, you know no one's memory is accurate, where they just you know I know you know every story. Well, you tell me every detail of every story then if your memory is accurate and you heard it before. But everyone's different and. Um, you know, I, I just I'll say winning did not get old. Yeah, well, yeah, I I read his book and I've listened to him on several different um, podcasts and interviews outside of football because it's kind of cool to listen to Pete where 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 the average Joe is just talking to him about life and his approach to life is just like you get done listening to him and it has nothing to do with football like you know just his approach to life and the way you handle everyday things. It, it's cool, man, and you can really get a lot from it. I think the coolest thing I learned was when I was coaching for him, and I'm talking every second of every day he's trying to find a way to get better. Um, and it's just – it's contagious, and you take it over to your life and just like, hey, like, well, can I do anything better? Can I do this better? And, um, you know, that – Sitting in those meetings, you know, hearing all those great coaches that I, you know, I coached under, uh, Chris Richard, you know, all of them, Bevel, Cable, you know, their approach to open-minded and, and, and receptive to, to new ways to learn and new ways to get across information to their players, it was uh, unbelievable. All right, one more Seahawks story before I let you go. So, so Walter Jones, who's co-host on the fifth quarter with us every week, he uh, – he told me about a story that uh, that he called you. It was maybe the first time he called you by your name yeah. at a golf tournament. He he, att he attempted it, and uh, <laughs> so we were sitting there, and uh, and he goes, "Hey, hey, yo, Chalupa," <laughs> and I was like, "He's not talking to me, is he?" And, and uh, so I look over, and he goes, "Chalupa." He's like, "Yo, man, I just want to say you're really all right, though," and and that was his way of like saying, you know, "Hey, you're a pretty good ball player." <laughs> And I was like, I was not about to correct Walter Jones on how to say my name because I was a rookie. So I was like, hey, Walt, one, I didn't even know you could talk. And two, thank you for acknowledging me. Because 
he was always the strong, silent type, you know, literally. He, you know, and that's why I love seeing him on, on TV with you and, 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 and doing these radio things because uh, he always had one of the greatest personalities. He just never brought her out. Yeah. And so it was, uh, but that was a wild moment. And, uh, and, you know, he was like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, huh? And, uh, <laughs> You're like, and, you know, but what I took away from it, and what I always remember, hey, Walter Jones, he somewhat knows my name, and he called me pretty good, <laughs> and like, you know, to get that kind of from from a Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, and that's what I always wanted to know because everybody asks, they ask, you know, regular players like me, like, yo, who was you know tough to go against, and then you you always talk about Walter Jones and the Hall of Famers, right? Yeah. And uh, I always wanted to ask him. Even though I'd ever seen people, anybody really give him, you know, trouble in a game. I think he might have given up one sack in my first four or five years with, you know, when we were on the teammates. Uh, but it's just I always want to, yo, who was, uh, you know, who was the person that you were like you had a lot of respect for? It has to be another Hall of Famer, right? I don't, I don't imagine anybody just giving him fits yeah. other than that. Yeah. But because um, I mean, the the two, I think it was four total sacks that I've seen in the span of the career. Two of them came against New York, OCU and York. Walter had the worst high ankle sprain I ever seen, and I can't believe he even suited up. And he won't tell you this, but I will gladly tell you this. Right. And then um, another time was a year later. It was his knee, um, in which I, th I believe he needed microfracture surgery, and Demarcus Ware got got a sack. I mean, so you, and you take about these are two guys. I mean, I'm sure I I have to look at the stats, but OC had to be a 70, 80 sack guy, and, and Demarcus Ware is going to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. So it's like, man, like it still took injuries to get by that guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's you got a lot of pride too. Like you're right. I think Holmgren told me he went in there at halftime and saw Walt, and he was like. He couldn't believe that he was, you know, just gonna willing to go back out there, and he said, yeah, I like, mean, I, told him no." Yeah, yeah. you got you, you had to say him from the south, man. Like you know, like a lot of the greats, he was like, "Hey, man, you, you can't go." Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. got to tell them. Man, I'll tell you what, it's been great catching up to you. I want, I want to people. We, Lofa Tatupu has a, a new company that's going to be a big launch October sixteenth. Zone in balance, uh, the CBD um, treatment. Tell, give, give us one last pitch and where people can get it. Uh, Zone in CBD right now available online at our site, zoneincbd.com. Give us a follow on the social. Uh, we appreciate it. It's all about, you know, just promoting health and wellness and, and, and love and respect. And um, that's, the, that's the culture and the tribe that we're building. And, uh, you know, we, we hope you join us on this journey. Now, listen, to it. it's done wonders for you. You are uh, the self-testament of this, of this product and the way you feel. And, and from where you were to where you are today, man, you're looking good, sounding good. Yeah, you, you are dialed in, my man. I'm zoned in. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Lopa. I appreciate you, brother.